So hello and welcome to the video. I've made a number of videos now about the British Airways Executive Club and the dangers of doing so, indeed the dangers of making any factual video, is that things change. British Airways has tinkered with a number of aspects of the Executive Club since I made those original videos, which has led me to make a series of update videos whenever a material number of changes have been actioned. But I also make videos about other things, and those other things are also liable to change. So I thought it was time to make an update video about changes I've noticed to other schemes beyond the British Airways Executive Club. Mostly. So if that sounds good, stick around. Hi, I'm Matt. I've lived in five countries on four continents. I've flown over 1.4 million miles. I've visited over 100 countries, every American state, but I'm nowhere near done. So subscribe, and you might pick up some hacks, hints and tips to make your next trip better. So I made a video about which hotel booking engine you should use, and I recommended Hotels.com at the end of that video, as it has a very generous and flexible rewards program associated with it. Basically, after every 10 nights you book, you get 10% of the total spend on those nights back in the form of a voucher you can apply against a future booking. You may have been able to find a cheaper hotel for a specific night than was available on Hotels.com, but when you take into account the value of this 10% rebate, Hotels.com was the clear winner. I use them, I rate the scheme very highly, and they have built great loyalty from me as a result. But Hotels.com is owned by Expedia, and it has been announced that the Expedia Rewards Programme will be rolled over the Hotels.com Reward Programme at some point in the near future. That scheme effectively delivers a 2% rebate on all purchases made through Expedia Group companies, which can be for flights or for hotels. Now this change isn't in force yet, and it hasn't been announced precisely when it will affect the UK, but it is something to be aware of because it might change your behaviour now. The value of any reward that you have built up when the change takes place will be preserved, but your ability to use it might be a little different. Now of course, Hotels.com might reduce the cost of its rooms by 8% to equalise out the difference in the cost of the rewards package. They might, but I'm not holding my breath that they do. Now I've often said that these reward schemes are not your reward scheme. They are built to maximise the profits of the operator. If that maximisation of profits coincides with rewarding you as a loyal customer, then it's win-win. But Hotels.com, or more likely their owner Expedia, has concluded that the rewards programme is too generous, so they are slashing it. When this change takes place, I will probably make a new video about hotel booking engines, and I think it's fair to say that my sense of loyalty towards Expedia will have been greatly reduced as a result of this. Point two is that Virgin Atlantic has joined SkyTeam. They have resisted the urge of joining a global alliance for close to 40 years, but they have finally given in, and on March the 2nd they joined SkyTeam. They're 49% owned by Delta, which is part of SkyTeam, and for several years now they've had a marketing alliance with Air France KLM, which is also part of SkyTeam, so this is probably not a huge shock. I think it is a significant and positive development, as you now have the opportunity of earning rewards through Virgin or through any of the SkyTeam partners on Virgin or on any of the SkyTeam partners. And your status in the programme will extend both ways. Now, Virgin is restricting access for status holders to its London Clubhouse Lounge, but it is now allowing status holders into their Clubhouse Lounges in outstations. There has been some talk that Virgin may build a new lounge in Terminal 4 in London to accommodate those status holders, as it may be cheaper for them to do that than to pay for access into a third-party lounge there. But having said that, the pressure on the lounge access was coming from KLM and Air France sharing space in Terminal 3, but they unexpectedly, and I'm sure unrelatedly, recently announced that they were moving back to Terminal 4. And that only leaves Virgin and Delta in Terminal 3, which doesn't put nearly as much pressure on the lounge as would have been the case before that. It makes it much tougher for people travelling on a SkyTeam connection because they now have to change terminals, but it probably has eased some of the difficulty that Virgin would have faced otherwise. 
Now point three flows on from this, which is that I made a series of videos about which Star Alliance loyalty program you should join. I have been asked a number of times to do the same for Sky Team, but I resisted doing so because it really wasn't a particularly relevant alliance to those living in the UK before Virgin joined. But now Virgin has joined, the Sky Team allowance is now much more relevant to UK residents. Indeed, it's arguably more relevant now than Star Alliance. So I will be making that video and I am planning to make it in the next month or so. But the point is that that Star Alliance video I made has been rendered partially obsolete by a change that has been made to the Aegean programme. I recommended Aegean and backed up that recommendation by joining the scheme myself. But I didn't join Aegean because it was the easiest airline to get status with. There are usually a couple of Star Alliance airlines that will match you across, which gets you the status instantly. Instead, I joined them because they were the easiest program to retain status with. And as I reported in that video, you needed only 12,000 miles in a year, provided you took four flights on Aegean to retain your gold status. And if you didn't fly at all on Aegean, you needed 24,000 miles. Now as some context, I recently flew from Bangkok to Singapore to New York and earned 13,000 miles for just those two sectors, which is a very large part of the way towards that renewal. But in the same way that the Hotels.com scheme isn't yours, the Aegean scheme isn't yours either, and they have made a change which is of significant detriment to their members. Hopefully, me drawing attention to the attractiveness of this scheme didn't play a part in their decision. So now, renewal requires 12,000 miles, including four flights on Aegean planes, or 70,000 miles with no Aegean flights. This actually brings Aegean in line with many of the other Star Alliance carriers when it comes to renewal, so in some ways it's perhaps not unexpected, but it is a near trebling of that renewal requirement. And that's a big deal. The change wasn't widely advertised, and I only noticed it when I was on the Aegean site checking out a redemption. But it is going to be a big deal for you if you chose the Aegean scheme because of the ease of requalification and you happen to live in a part of the world where it is quite difficult to get on Aegean flights. For me, it's not a disaster. Aegean has quite an interesting network and it's no great hardship for me to fit in a long weekend at some point during the year through which I can take those four Aegean flights. I don't think I would get anywhere near the 70,000 miles without flying on Aegean, so it looks as if I will have to factor in a trip each year going forwards. Now if you'd invested the time in getting to gold with that 24,000 renewal point in mind, I can imagine you're going to be pretty irritated. But as I've said several times now, it's not your programme, it's the airlines, and you always have to be somewhat braced for a change to go against you, although this is quite a significant change. So I'm now going to contradict myself a little bit with point four and talk about two ways in which another loyalty program has actually gotten better for its members. I've talked a couple of times now about Barclays having developed a relationship with British Airways through which you can earn upgrade vouchers through credit cards and also banking with them. I say upgrade because it's effectively an Avio's discount on a purchase rather than an upgrade, but they call it an upgrade nevertheless. So the first enhancement is that Barclays has added a lounge access benefit to its programs. They've gone with Dragon Pass, which is a competitor with Priority Pass, but from a quick look around, it seems to have about the same sort of reach. It does require you, though, to pay an £18.50 fee for each access you wish to make to a lounge under this membership. That includes Plaza Premium lounges, and I had a quick look at Heathrow Terminal 2, and they wanted to charge me £48 for access on a dummy booking I made, so £18.50 does represent a significant discount. So it's a great benefit to have. Whether it will have much value to you will obviously depend on your travel patterns. For me, I've not used it yet, and I'm not sure I'll have an opportunity to anytime soon, but an improvement is always welcome. And if you have uh, an account with Barclays and also a credit card, you'll get the lounge access, but you'll also get four free access vouchers a year as an added benefit for having both of their products. The second enhancement concerns the question of how much is that upgrade voucher worth? Well, Barclays has given us an answer. They've given us the wrong answer, 
but they've given us an answer. You now have the opportunity to decline the opportunity of getting a voucher, and instead you will receive 7,000 avios on the anniversary of your membership of the scheme. That's £70 in value if you value an avio at 1p, which is certainly better than a poke in the eye with the proverbial. Now I just used a Barclays voucher and I got 100,000 avios in value for it, which I value at about £1,000, probably more. And the catch is that you have to nominate whether to go for the voucher or the avio at the start of the year. Now if you took a voucher and realised you hadn't used it the day before it expired, there would then be value in being able to cash it in for 7,000 avios. But that's not how it works, which means I will continue to take the voucher, and I think for the overwhelming majority of people that is the right option. There may be some for whom the 7,000 avios is a no-brainer, but I don't think it's going to be a very large group. But all options are good options, and credit to Barclays for adding these two things to their offering. Speaking of avios, and I don't usually like to talk about specific offers because I want my videos to be viewable for some time into the future, but right now at time of recording there is a superb welcome bonus on offer for taking out the Amex Platinum card. That brings lots and lots and lots of travel benefits. It's expensive, but the sign-up bonus is currently 60,000 avios plus a £200 credit, which you can use if you buy flights through Amex Travel, which you probably will if you have an Amex card. Now, I cannot advise on whether you should take a credit card or whether you should take this credit card. That's way beyond the scope of this channel. But I will point it out, and I will also mention that if you apply using a referral link, which I can forward to you, your welcome bonus will be increased to 65,000 avios. An email will be in the description below. Shoot me across an email, and I'll send you back the referral link. So point five is a significant one, and my tongue is firmly in my cheek. I've made a couple of videos now about the Travellers Century Club, a slightly quirky, slightly bonkers, non-profit club that significant travellers can join um, and basically brag about how many countries and territories they have visited. Those videos quoted the territory total, according to the TCC, as being 329, and the big news is that it's expanded by one, so there are now 330 territories available to you in the Travellers Century Club. So what's changed, I hear you ask? Well, St Kitts and Nevis is no longer St Kitts and Nevis, it is now St Kitts and Nevis. They have concluded that there's a separatist movement in Nevis and a high level of autonomy between the two parts of the country, which means that Nevis can now qualify to be a territory in its own right. As I said, it's all a bit silly, the rules are a bit silly, but it does mean now that you've got 330 territories available to you, and the details I've included in my previous videos are now wrong. Oh well, I'm sure we will all cope. And point six brings together three quite small points that I want to mention. I made a video about global entry and moaned a little bit that it had taken over 150 days for my conditional approval to come through. Now Justin R made a fantastic comment, thanks Justin, in which he talked about the fact that the systems in the United States seem to be linked. So if there is a backlog for granting conditional approvals, they cross-reference to the arrivals manifests. And if they see that an applicant is a shortly to arrive at the US border, they will accelerate through the conditional approval and issue it to you. And that certainly feels like that's what happened with me. I'd waited months and months and months, had a trip planned to the United States, and about 72 hours before I arrived, at the border, my conditional approval came through. And Justin thinks that that is actually quite a normal thing. So as an addendum to that global entry video, if you are waiting for conditional approval, booking a trip might push that approval through and get it in your hands a bit quicker than it might otherwise. I don't know, but it sounds plausible and I think it's a useful thing to note. So the second of my mini points talks about the strategy I have for renewing my gold status with British Airways, and I talked about some routes on Cathay Pacific within Asia. And it's been pointed out to me that there is a P-class booking fare bucket 
within the business class fair code family that currently doesn't earn avios and tier points into British Airways. The cheaper codes do, the more expensive codes within business class all do, but this P class code seems to be missing from the calculator. No one has succeeded in appealing and getting them credited through, or at least I don't know of anybody. So it's something to be aware of that if you are looking at taking a business class trip on Cathay Pacific, be very, very cautious of booking into a P fare code. You might not earn what you're expecting. And the last point is something I didn't actually mention in the video, but should have done, which was commented on, but which is now invalidated. So I talked about how I earned 300,000 avios in the year. And one of the ways that I didn't take advantage of is to pay bills using a service called Bill Hop. That was a scheme whereby you could use the normal payment system to reverse in an American Express card and use it therefore to pay bills and certain other expenses that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to use an Amex against. You were charged a fee for it, but overall it generally worked out advantageous to be able to get the points, particularly if you had a good and valuable way of spending those points. Now, Bill Hop has announced that it is closing this service to consumers, which means it will no longer be available. So I suppose my video was correct by not mentioning it, although I should have mentioned it, and now I would have had to correct it. Anyway, if you're thinking about using Bill Hop, don't. So there you go, six, perhaps eight ways that things have changed since I made my original video that you need to know about. Most of them negative, unfortunately, although a couple of them are quite nicely positive. Please give this video a like if you got something from it. Leave me a comment. Is this going to affect you in any way? Please consider subscribing if you're new. And if you'd like to support what I'm doing more directly, there is a Patreon account, the link to which is in the description below. And email me for that Amex referral code. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye.